when I started to come uh, and travel and come to America, I really discovered a new world, uh, which is a uh, um, hold on. Uh, sorry, I have the kids uh, running around, um, and I started to discover a new world. And I think one of the big, uh, you know, even though we do Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot, which are very classic Bordeaux varietals in Napa Valley. I started to discover a world of uh, wines that has nothing um, to envy or many differences and many similarities. And so how to decipher that? And when you make the wines, is how do you how do you take into account what you know, the classics that you've learned, but still adapt to the area where you are. And um, that's been a long journey. Uh, and it's humbling sometimes in the way how you need to relearn what you learn and what you've taken as uh, a basic concept. Uh, and also, you know, California has different soils, has different climate. And it's been uh, enriching to see after, you know, the last 10 years where um, the weather is riper, where we have more riper vintage. You get the guys from Baldo call you and ask you, hey, how, how do you do that? You know, how is it when it's ripe? But, um, the very, very baseline of difference between Bordeaux and Napa, for example, in, in our case, uh, is that I think in France every year you fight for ripeness. You fight to be able to ripen those grapes and you're really challenged by hail, by rain, uh, by mold, and you, you have very difficulty to get to ripeness. Where in California, I think getting to ripeness is the first step. It's a very easy process. But what we have to fight is the excess of ripeness, and it's the excess of sun, the, 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 that power of heat and richness. And it's, it's really where uh, the big difference is between the two parts of the world. And the way um, I approach that also is, you know, France has been making wine and there's trends that are changing, but it's very settled in their ways where California has a new, uh, very new, newer approach. Also, a lot of uh, um, the last 40 years has been a research for power and concentration and really, really powerful wines. And what I feel now, the industry is moving towards a little more balance, a little more finesse, and that's a little bit the French approach to wine. So for me, it's, you, you, we're not trying to mimic uh, what we do in Bordeaux, but we're trying to basically dial back uh, that power to bring a little more freshness, a little more aromatic, a little more elegance in the wines. And that research goes through basically maturity, but also how we take care of the canopies in the vineyard, um, how the, the, the cluster are positioned, you know, on the vine. So that dampen light uh, helps for an uniform maturity and no excess. Um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really the challenge of Napa Valley. And it's one, one of the old timers here when I arrive, say, oh, you French guy, you come and you pick early and then every year you pick early. Uh, because we, we learned something is... Uh, um, when you're at maturity, you have what we call the hang time, and it's really a challenge to navigate that time of ripeness, which is really where you develop that texture and layer in the, to the wines. But you have to na navigate those heat waves, and you have to navigate uh, that excess of weather to be able to not arm the fruit and, and preserve all those freshness and texture that you find in your wines. So that's really the challenge of California, and it's beautiful, I think, uh, uh, opportunity to be able to uh, to work with fruit and, and venture in a in a part that hasn't set a lot of standards but still established. And I think uh, the glass, the one you have your glasses today, is uh, is a representation of what we're trying. Um, so if you just, uh, you can chip in with uh, with some uh, questions also, and uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, put that into the, into the, the discussion. Um, so for, for uh, the, the Biwas and the Brion program, uh, we're working with vineyards, you know, like the Sleeping Lady vineyards, like the Upper Range vineyards uh, that have existed. I mean, the Upper Range knew, but Lady has existed for a long time. And when the Bettinelli family and 
Brian uh, took that over, uh, really focused on quality, really changed the farming. There was an improvement in the food quality uh, and there is an amazing uh, rise of, uh, of uh, quality that came through. And it shows that even though you have established vineyard in Napa Valley, um, if you take it as, uh, as it is, um, you know, it, it will never become special. But if you put the energy and the research into farming it better, uh, cultivating those details, all of a sudden you have wines that comes out of there that are really special and really, really unique. And uh, um, really, I mean, with Colin, it's like the assembly of all those wines and this collection of uh, different sites is really exciting. Uh, I call it Burgundian approach to Napa Valley because it's, uh, it's not Pinot, but we have those plot of lands that are really defined and we make a little bit of wine from each plot. Uh, and it's like almost a clue. And then in your wines, you will find a typical expression. I think one of the richness with Massimo is that uh, we, we basically have different hands in the process, uh, which allows to have different character and different expression. And so for each site, it will pair a little bit, uh, you know, it will, it will transform that expression into something a little more special. Um, but Colin, uh, so, I mean, someone is asking for the similarities I see between Sleeping Lady and the Left Bank in Bordeaux. Uh, it's, it's a very good question because the more I go to Bordeaux for the, for the primeur and the more I find California flavors into the into the, the Bordeaux wines. And that's because also the French palette uh, is becoming more international. The wines are being more exported. And there is something that Sleeping Lady does really well is the preservation of aromatics because we are on a slight bench uh, that is east facing. So meaning that the sun gets up in the morning and you get that fresh morning temperature with a lot of sun uh, in the cold uh, part of the day. And then as the day warms up and you get into the afternoon, the sun goes behind the mountain. And after like 4 or 5 p.m., you don't have direct sun on the vineyard. So you're still bathing in the heat. But you don't, it's not thrown overboard by um, uh, the addition of the direct sun. Um, so it really preserves the fruit and it really helps the vineyards to uh, pre retain uh, freshness in the aromatics. I think the Sleeping Lady nose uh, for Cabernet are very true to varietal and very, very uh, elegant. Um, we use different clones there. I think Clone 7 has a tendency to bring that, that blueberry, blackberries that you find in the Boyac wines, for example. Uh, but in the end, it's a really California wine. So it's a really a Napa Valley wine with all its richness and texture. And I think that's, uh, that's something that we're starting to understand is uh, I think an average Napa Valley wine will age seven to 10 years where an exceptional uh, left bank wine will age 70. And the exceptional Napa that we're driving for are gonna last. That's really, really exciting. Will they last 20 years or how long? I think, I mean, most, no, it's interesting, but most of the wines, I mean, it's been 15 years here now, and all the stuff I open at seven, eight euros is barely starting to change. And it's just starting to open up. And when we talked about exceptional wine, the, you know, the mark for Cabernet Sauvignon um, in Bordeaux is 10 to 15 years. If you have a wine that stays young for 10 years to 15 years, it's considered exceptional, uh, which means the exception. We don't do exceptional on average, and that's um, and that's Bordeaux. That's that's what's happening. That's why you have so little first growth and second growth, and you have a plethora of uh, cheaper wine. And um, I think in Napa, on average, we can make a Cabernet that lasts seven to ten years. It's you know the weather is there, the ripeness is there. It's just uh, we have to be careful as humans do not over manipulate and over extract the wines and damage them. Uh, and those damage, usually you don't see them in the use of the wine because of, uh, that ripeness covers it. But at 10, 15 years, when the wine is really starting to change, then you see if you have that aromatic potential, you see if you have that stability of color. And that's really what's gonna give you something that 
um, thrive through the times. You know, it's uh, it's uh, something very. Um, we always look for the eternal use, and I think that's uh, when we find it in wines, uh, we know. Uh, and some someone's asking, uh, you know. Are the wines going to be better at 10 years? That's a question of personal opinion and palette. You know, do you like to drink young wines or aged wines? But I think what I look at is that the, the speed of change and how much they change over time and how stable they are over time. And if you have a stability over time that starts in the barrel, we see it when we taste and the wines are very stable, um, then we'll have the stability. And I think uh, achieving a seven to ten year window on those wines is uh, as as really the young phase, huh? really the beginning, uh, is is a. Someone, uh, John, John is loving the sixteen right now. Yes, and that's uh, the magic of California too. So we are able to produce wines early on that really tastes good and are approachable. And it's not a massive tannin that you're going to have to lay down to age. Uh, also, we take care of that in the winery and in the extract. And we spend a lot of time during harvest uh, and during the fermentation to make sure our extractions are managed properly, that our wines, we just reviewed all the 20 uh, quickly, uh, just a, a little bit of a ad hoc uh, review to see, you know, and, and because the wine's cheap. Um, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, it, it, so there's a lot of other challenges. I said about it later, but uh, it's um, it's uh, it's it, it's a it's it, when when you manage it that early on into the tank, and after all you have to do is make sure you have a smooth integration of the oak for the next. Uh, and and put it in the bottle, so you, you can bring it home really easily uh, from the and with the pedigree of vineyards we have accessible. Um, basically, everything is the work on the detail, and there is no major correction. Julian, do you think that the wine? Do you think that the wines of Bordeaux are accessible younger these days than historically? Uh, so yes, I, I, I totally agree with that statement. Uh, I think uh, in the modern, we, you know, in the French sometimes are a little bit like, my God, they're uh, they are making wine that are almost bloody in France, uh, which is more early on, more easy to drink. Uh, but also there is a culture in France to drink some of the wines that are uh, less concentrated, less extracted, uh, while you wait for the Um And I think... Um, this is this goes with uh, basically aging wines and having a, an ongoing cellar that you refill and you curate. Uh, I think the U.S. are learning to do that. People are building cellars more and more in their homes, uh, and they're starting to lay down the wines and 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 learn that management. Um, but a lot of the American wine are still drunk pretty young. So you think some wines are drunk too young? Do you think any wines are drunk too old? Yes and yes. <laughs> no, sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes there's a lot of hype around the older, older bottles of wine that are just dead. I thought and that the French said that there's no wine drunk too soon. <laughs> um, no, because it's always oh, so that that falls into a different. It's cu being curious, and that's why you buy six bottle cases is because one and you drink it and you're like oh i opened it too early yeah but that was an information on how you should take care of the rest and then six months later you pull another one and you're like still too early and find a reason to drink better and drink a little more that's a great point i, lo I love how you said that, that that the bordelais are calling you to get to get advice about warmer vintages i, I think it's really cool that it's kind of come full circle because you know, California has always looked to France for, for, you know, best practices, for information, for farming, for winemaking. And it's kind of cool that it's kind of come full circle now. You have to remember that the French uh, found the phylloxera with American uh, cutting. 
uh, and the rootstock is mostly American. It's actually when you saw a rootstock planted without uh, a vine on it, it's called an American in France. Right. Uh, and because it's an American rootstock. So I think the circle keeps going. And the more we make wine in America, the more we are realizing uh, that, you know, we're building our style and our uh, level of excellence. And I think when the world as large, Bordeaux is the number one um, salesperson in, Amer- in the world for wine, when you can come uh, fight toe to toe with those people and um, stand on your own uh, with the wines we produce, I think uh, all of a sudden there is a, an opening to okay, what are those guys doing? Why are they doing it like that? And maybe we can learn. That's fantastic. Um, so I think we should uh, uh, wrap up any questions for Julian, but uh, before we move on to Ramiro, but Julian, there was a question if you know a. Uh, uh, a winery in Provence called Visan, V-I-S-A-N. So, no, it depends. It's also pretty large. So I'm, I'm from the south, south, like on the border. Uh, That's so why I, you're I not Italian? Is that why? <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't walk too far from the border. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and someone, someone was asking uh, how we split between me, Massimo, and uh, we have Mark, Harold as well. Uh, I think Massimo or originally, uh, I mean, he overseeing all the wines uh, and then he attributed a couple set of vineyards specifically to me, to Mark uh, himself. So we, we have that way, certain wines are made by certain winemakers and it allows you to down the vineyard also drive the style of that part of your vineyard. And then you would slide down to Detroit and you look at like Christian Wood. I mean, when you look at him. I think uh, someone's asking a question, but can't quite hear. Not loud uh, enough. In terms of do they give Wood some money? Or do so, they- yeah, we'll try and keep up on the questions on the chat. Um, but uh, just so we can make sure we have everyone in uh, and don't go over for those who have to leave, let's, uh, if, you, if it's okay, let's go ahead and segue over to Ramiro. Um, and then we'll, at the very end, we'll have a kind of a, a group question and answer for all the panelists. Um, so I'd like to introduce you guys to Ramiro Herrera, who's uh, over here in Napa Valley. And Ramiro is a master cooper, one of very few, uh, less than 40 in the world. And so he's uh, uh, trained in France and, and uh, makes barrels just by hand with his own tools that he's made himself. And so he uh, really special uh, uh, attributes to the team. And um, Ramiro has been working with the winemaking team for several years to make barrels specifically for us. And so uh, they actually take it uh, with Brian Wise's um, uh, and John Caldwell's uh, uh, work in the, on the trees. And so I actually, I forgot to mention that uh, Brian and Rhonda are on, are on the call with us tonight. So uh, uh, excited That's to have them with us. And Brian will be saying a few words, I think towards the end, but. Uh, uh, Ramiro bringing in the barrel program and uh, really customizing our barrels for each of the specific uh, wines, whether it's Cabernet uh, or Pinot Noir, and then specifically uh, by vineyard as well. And so uh, it's, uh, it's an ongoing process, but uh, I'll have him talk more about how they source the trees um, and bring it from tree uh, to, to barrel and there to, for, to bottle. So uh, without further ado, Ramiro Herrera, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Um, so, Ramiro, if you could just describe a little bit about your, your work and uh, how, your, how your process works and uh, kind of walk us through wor- working from the tree, uh, the tree sourcing all the way to the finished product. All right. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ramiro Herrera. Like Colin said, I'm a master cooper. For you guys that don't know what that is, it's a master cooper can actually... Uh, Teach people how to build barrels. So I'm one of uh, less than 40 in a year uh, in the world, sorry. And I've been building barrels for Be Wise for seven and a half years now. So um, uh, I'm happy to be around uh, uh, people that really have a lot of knowledge in, uh, in wine. Uh, that kind of, it's kind of like a challenge for me because we're uh, 
you know, the more uh, you do this, the more you learn. So yeah, I, I, uh, do, uh, the way we do things here is uh, we basically uh, up to France. We used uh, one specific uh, forest. It's about six or seven forests in France, which I think uh, uh, yeah. the forest that we source our wood is called Vite. So it's one of the most expensive uh, forests in the world, basically. Uh, so we go there, we actually pick our trees. Uh, there's uh, an auction every November. And that's the only place where we can buy our trees. So you basically can cut a tree that is less than 150 years old. So these are very, very old trees here. So. Um, uh, I mean, this action is pretty fair, I think. Uh, it's uh, you know, at once in the action, you know, you, 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 you basically go look at the tree before the action, you, you, you pick the trees you're going to bet on. There, the action, uh, you go bet on that one, and you can only bet once. It's like a secret bet, which makes it very equal for, the, for everyone. Otherwise, you know, the big guys will basically take all the trees. So... We're kind of small in this business. Uh, uh, we're trying to, what we're trying to do here is to have consistency with the wines. You know, barrels are close to 40 to 50% of the taste of the wine. So if you have the same person building your barrels all the time, you're most likely going to have that consistency. And we can adjust depending on what, how the winemaker wants it, you know, what, what direction. He wants uh, to take on the wine, and uh, so basically, the uh, the, way, the the best part of the barrel is the toasting part, you know, which is basically what I do. So um, uh, there's like five or six different toasting levels that we use uh, for the for the Brion uh, wines. Uh, uh, we use a, a kind of higher toast because they want to get that chocolate coffee taste. Uh, you know, as you get more of the medium toast, lighter toast, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's always a challenge, you know, working with three different winemakers. Everyone has his own style, you know, uh, but uh, when you love what you do, it's super easy. You know, I, 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 I've been doing this for 28 years. Uh, I still enjoy what I do. Uh, I mean... It's not an easy thing. I mean, when I went to school, uh, uh, like Colin said, uh, it was a tough four years of training. You know, it was no power tools allowed. Uh, you had to build your own tools, a lot of your own tools. I mean, not all of them, but you're basically building everything by hand. Use axes, hammer, drivers, you know, knives. Uh, scrapers, hand planers, hand saws, you know, that everything is, is, is by hand. You know, it's, it's a hard thing, you know. When, it's not an easy thing, but when you love what you do, again, uh, it makes it easy. So basically, I, I brought in uh, to this program because, uh, you know, they, they, again, they wanted to have consistency on the taste. So, so um, for me, it's been very delightful working for these two guys. I mean, we, they make really good wines. Uh, you know, they have great winemakers. They make my job super easy. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, uh, if you guys have any questions about barrels, how, how, how the toast goes, I can explain a little bit like how the toast goes. Uh, hey, hey Romero? No, no, you're yeah. Right. Romero, this is Brian. I want, I want the crowd to know a couple things. Uh, yeah. One, these forests in, in um, France. France were started by Napoleon, and yeah. they, were really, they were really started for warships. So yeah. the military always starts everything, and then we live off what the military starts. But I also want people to know that, you know, traditionally in Sonoma, uh, you might have $2,000 worth of grapes in a barrel. In our high-end vineyards in Napa now, we have $12,500 worth of grapes in a barrel. And so having someone like you who does a consistent toast 
done properly every time um, to get what the, the winemakers want is critical because if you have a bad barrel, you lose $12,500 worth of grapes oh, immediately. Yeah. So the grape costs are so high that you can't afford to have bad barrels. And that's why Romero's here is not only to, to bring consistency to what we want and move it wherever we want it, but also not to have a barrel that ends up saying, well, we got to junk that one. It, it wasn't right. So just to give a little um, overview why he is so important to the team. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I, it's true. Uh, John tells me all the time, you know, you, remember you can screw it up everyone's job, so you better pay attention to what the hell you're doing because. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's right, you know, and, and I do. When I toast the barrels, I basically – become one of those dogs in the airport, smelling every single barrel, you know, you, you, I got to get a perfect, uh, depending on what wine we're going to put into. I can explain a little bit of the toasting part, you know, uh, the way it works, at least on my side, and, but that's basically like the more standard way to the, the toasting goes. So basically when you toast in a barrel uh, for the first 30 minutes, they're all kind of smell the same because the wood is barely heating up and and uh, so after the 30 minutes, basically every 10 to 12 minutes changes. So that's when the, you basically need to stick your nose inside the barrel and, and decide what flavor you're gonna give to the wine. So the way this works is you start with vanilla, mocha, coconut, then you go to spicy and then chocolate and coffee. So the, the longer you toast the barrels, the more you're going to cook the tannins of the oak. So if you have a, a grape that has a lot of tannins, like Cabernet, you know, Petit Verdot, some of those grapes that have a lot of tannins, Tanat, uh, you want to you wanna toast the barrels a little longer so you get rid of the tannins of the oak so you don't mix them with the tannins of the grapes. Otherwise, your tannins will feel like sandpaper. So... If, if the grapes don't have a lot of tannins, then you kind of toast them a little lighter so you can keep some of the tannins of the oak. So you can get a little, you know, get the wine a little bolter, you know, the way California wines are. I mean, Julian explained it perfectly right. You know, in, in France, uh, a lot of people don't like uh, the oak to show. In California, we love that. We like bold, big wines, you know. Basically, uh, uh, that's the way... Uh, I've been doing this for the past 28 years. I worked 20 years for a cooperage here in Napa. It's called Cigar Moreau, and that's the way people were ordering their barrels. So, I mean, we changed the style depending what country we were sending the barrels. But in this case, I basically know what, what you, Brian, like, what John likes, what the winemaker like. You know, it's super easy for me. For me, it's like, the remote control watching TV is super easy. You know, I, I, I basically do the same thing every year. And, it, and if you guys need to adjust anything, all you have to do is let me know. And, and I just lift the barrel on the fire for a little longer or a little less, and that will change the flavors of it. That's so, great. Uh, hey, Romero. Hey, Romero. As, by the yeah. way, Romero is also our whiskey guy. And are you sitting in the whiskey room there? Yeah, yeah. I had a, I had a bourbon a whiskey glass right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. So, Romero, there's a couple. There's a few questions coming through. Yeah. Uh, the first one is: Is how long does the wood sit before before cutting? Before yeah. So the, the the wood ages uh, between two years to five years. You know the our 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 wood is basically around the 28, 30 months. Uh, we're basically looking for uh, the moisture content. Uh, the moisture can be any lower than 12% because if it's less than 12%, when you bend the barrel, when you bend the staves, uh, they basically break in the middle because it's too dry. And you don't want it to be over 16% because if it's over 16% moisture, that means the wood is still a little green, so you will taste that on the wine. So, I mean, so it has to be in between those two percentages right there. So we're, we, we age our wood outside, we air dry it. Uh, we never put our wood in, in the kilt, you know, to, 
to, to uh, speed the maturation. You know, we leave it outside uh, for about 28 to 30 months around there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, another question is, can you talk about your tools that you, that you use to make the barrels? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, what, one of the main thing is we call it a driver. Uh, it's the driver and the hammer. That's, that's basically my computer here. You know, you know that's, that's what I use all the time. You, know, that's, you use that to tighten the hoops, uh, to take the hoops off, to insert the head. That's the main tool. I mean, when you go to school, that's the first thing you're going to learn. And uh, the second tool that I use the most is the axe. Because when, uh, when a, a stay breaks, once the barrel is done, you put wine on it and starts leaking or the stay breaks, you, you have to replace that, that stay. Break. So you can't put the whole barrel in the machine again to, to do the crozer. The crozer is the part where, the, where you insert the head. So you basically do... Uh, the two ends of the barrel by hand and you use the axe with it. So you knock the, the tips and you make the little group where the head is going to insert. So that's, that's the other tool that I use a lot. So the other one's a scraper. The scraper is basically like a sander, like an old school sander. You know, you, when I was in school, I, you know, weren't allowed to use any electrical tools. So the scraper basically is the one that takes the stains out the, to make the barrel a little nicer, smooth. I mean, you can't go against the grain because that makes it a little rough. So you have to find the grain, how the grain going on, on the staves and you got to go with the grain of the wood. So, so the wood will be nice and smooth. Those are the three ones that I use the most. I mean, there, I use knives, I use, uh, you know, hand planers to, to kind of level the top of the barrel to make it look nice. Uh, there's a lot of tools that I, that I use, but uh, those are the main ones. I mean, remember, I, I use machines now, you know, only when I repair it is when I use this old tool. Romero, the question is, how many barrels do you make in a year, typically? Uh, between the two wineries, I built between 250 to 270 every year. I think, yeah, it's about 100. It's about 100 for us and about 100 for Caldwell, give or take, right? Well, remember last year, it was a little more than 100. I mean, the year before that, so it, yeah, it varies. It depends on how many, uh, how much wine you guys make. In there, yeah. uh, and then also, how many barrels you get out of one tree? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, it's kind of sad that, uh, you know, you wait 150 years to cut a tree, and then uh, the most that I have known, you know, I have seen uh, from a 150 year old tree uh, is six the most. But average is about four around there. Because you, you don't use the whole tree. You, you only use certain part of the tree. You only use until the branches start growing. And when you cut the tree, you cut them in, in one meter logs and you won't use the outside of the, of the log and you, not, you don't use the middle part of the log. You only use the in between the outside and the middle because the middle is very brittle, so it'll break very easy. The outside is is, is very soft, so it, it will leak. So you have to use just in between those two, and you have to do a quarter zone cut, which you want the grain to, to run from north to south. Uh, that way, you know it keeps it by by leaking. So uh, uh, one, one last question, Ramiro, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to move on to, to Massimo, but then we'll have another, we'll ha answer some of these questions at the end as well. But uh, people are asking if, if you're passing your art on to anyone. Are, are you training anyone to, to follow in your footsteps? You know, uh, when I was uh, at the Cooperage, uh, I did train a lot of people, uh, some young guys, you know. I, but uh, unfortunately, no one wanted to go like, all the way through but right now no it's just me it's it's uh since i started working for uh by's and caldwell it's, it's only me building the barrel so i would love to, to train people i mean but you know it's a hard work and not not everyone wants to get into this because this is not an easy thing but you know I, if, if someone is willing to learn i would love to show them no problem do we have any volunteers raise your hand <laughs> All right, there you go. You got a couple, couple, a couple apprentices. 
Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. And Colin, if, if I can add, is um, to Ramiro. Ramiro learn the traditional ways, and sometimes I think too many. It's easy to use the machine, but the length of time it takes to learn those basics, even though you're not going to use them or you're seldom going to use it, it allows you to understand the product. But I believe barrels are even more complex than wine. And between the selections, uh, how you cut the tree, where you get it from, how you toast it, how you age it, uh, it the multiplication of details becomes incredible. So just quickly, uh, the question was, so Ramiro, the training to be a master cooper is four years, correct? Four years, yeah. Four years, no power tools allowed. Four years, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so that, I know there's a few other questions about barrels and for Ramiro, and we'll get to some of those at the end. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, so Ramiro, thanks so much for appreciate that. Um, and we'll, uh, if you can stay on, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up some questions towards the end. But I wanted to, to move on so we can make sure we get Massimo yeah. uh, to talk a little bit tonight as well. So um, uh, Massimo has been working with us winemaking from the very beginning. So this will be the 19th year, in fact. Um, and so I uh, 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 thought it would be fun for, for us to talk with him and uh, get his insight on how, how he has learned about winemaking and how, how uh, France and Bordeaux specifically has influenced that a little bit. Uh, but also kind of give you guys uh, um, an insight to the vintage this year. There's, there's already been a few questions about the vintage 2020 and, and some of the issues with the fires and so on. Uh, so we'll certainly get to that. Um, but uh, so I'd like to introduce Massimo Monticelli. He's joining us also from Napa Valley this evening. Uh, and so Massimo, if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you saw Bordeaux and, and, and what, when you're going to school and learning winemaking and uh, if, how that in, uh, influenced your thought process towards what you do uh, in Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley today. No, I, I, I was, I was saying, well, first of all, I'll say uh, Ramiro does a fantastic job also. I want, I want, I want to get that out there because it, it's, it's having those consistent barrels no bad ones that really makes our job a lot easier and not having to kick any water, any barrels of wine out. So, so thank you, Ramiro. And, uh, and uh, yeah. And then secondly, yeah, France is the gold standard. I mean, Bordeaux is, is, is the, is, is where we learned about, you know, to me, everybody else is just, especially a hundred years ago, everybody else is just making a beverage. You know, France is what turned it into a, you know, a, a, a glass full of art. And, uh, and, you know, that's where we started to realize here in Napa, we might be able to do that too. And the, the um, you know, we learned everything. It's just starting with the, the clones. And the, I mean, France had all these years to, to, uh, to select Cabernet and Merlot and everything like that. That's, that's what we use because they're the best because they selected them. They found them. They, 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 they perfected them. And, uh, and it's, you know, because we, there are a whole bunch of other ver clones and varieties out there, but they're just not as good. And uh, so Fran that's, that's the, step one is getting the right, the right noble vines to, uh, to, to make wine out of. Uh, and then the, the, what France really taught me, because it is a little bit different because they do deal with a, co a cooler climate there. So, so it, it's, they do, like Julian alluded to, there, there's a, there's a, they have a different problem of trying to get grapes ripe. Where we get grapes ripe, no problem. We're just trying to maintain structure and acidity is another thing we lose over here. And so we're trying to, get, we're trying to balance it on that side. Uh, but what France did do that we didn't do in the beginning is, is, is terroir, local small plots of land, and where you actually get a real feeling for you know, this mountain, that mountain, you know, Howell Mountain, Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain. And, and then even then in, in, in on those mountains, there's so many different uh, flavors also. And it, it's, it's fun to be able to, to try all those different kinds and, and, and let those vineyards express themselves as opposed to just, you know, I would, you know, I'd say, you know 15 years ago, we were kind of making wines that were just you know, very ripe and didn't have any, they didn't express anything from the actual soil and we're, we're getting back to that now and so by not you know not picking super ripe not picking things that are uh, you know basically raisins and then uh, and uh, so we're actually getting things from the terroir and actually getting wines that are aging longer too those, those wines never age very well they, they, they always kind of fall apart after a few years 
So it's nice that you know France is you know, is, is again the gold standard in how how we need to uh, to make wines that are uh, that, that last a lot while and have structure and actually show the character of the vineyard itself. Um, I say, then segueing into uh, this this year, 2020, we have uh, we had a little bit of smoke uh, from from a few fires, but uh, but it's 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 not as bad. We actually understand uh, we understand fires and smoke a lot better just because we're I guess it's going to be what we're going to get used to. But uh, it's not just the fact that there's smoke in the valley or smoke from a fire. There's always a fire somewhere that's got a little haze in in, in the valley. It's how close you are to the actual fire, how close, you know, it, it's, it's how, uh, how, how the wind is blowing. I mean, I, I know there were some vineyards that were up half a mile away from raging fires, but the wind was blowing the other direction and it didn't affect that vineyard at all. Like it completely made great wine. And then there's other vineyards that are two miles away, but the wind was blowing right at it. And you get a little bit of smoke out of that one. So it, it's, a, it's still hit or miss. But we're going through and we're tasting everything, and we've actually been pretty lucky. We don't have very many uh, smoky wines just because where where our vineyards are located, they weren't in the direct line of sight of the fire. So we're uh, we're pretty we're, we're pretty happy this year. And uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see, I, you know the 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 process that we use to make wines is a uh, we do. Brian Wise has actually been key in getting all these different. Uh, vineyards from different areas of Napa and Sonoma and everywhere and even with with Pinot Noir from the coast and from Oregon and yeah every little vineyard has its own flavor its own terroir and its own signature it's it's it, I'd say it's really not up to me or us as winemakers to to create a wine that's fantastic it's actually to channel the grapes that come from that soil into being the best wine that it can be it's it's a it's it's not a it's not fixed. It's you know you don't you're not going to create a wine from bad grapes. You have to you you your your job is to keep a wine from good grapes to be the best it can be. And uh, I always my favorite line to say is my job not to screw it up. You know that that's uh, that's what that's what we do. Um, now this uh, hey, this well. yeah. There's a there's a couple questions coming in. Um, yeah. uh, one about. Uh, a qu interesting question is can smoke make an interesting flavor in the wine uh it depends on whether you like scotch uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you like if you love scotch you might love these wines <laughs> um yeah no, that it, 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 there's there's different levels of smoke in wine too where there's there's parts that are it's just a hint and it comes across more like the smokiness of a barrel not so much smoke from a from a fire and then there's also the bad smoke where it just smells like a, it smells like an ashtray and you know, it smells like, like a really peaty, smoky scotch. And, and that's, that just to me doesn't work in wine. I mean, it, but I, I'm not going to, I won't deny somebody that does like that, but, but it's just not, not what, a, not what I would want. So, so like many things, the devils and the details in terms of the type of smoke, the location of the vineyard. So it's uh, uh, more, more complicated, but uh, as I say, in real estate, location, location, location. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and like all, all vintages they talk about in wine, I really hate it when they say this is a great vintage or this is a bad vintage because it really depends on where exactly what vineyard you're talking about because it's not just a simple, you know, the, you know 2016 best vintage ever. No, don't, don't do that because I, I can show you some wines that were not good in 2016. <laughs> I think there has been some research about a correlation between certain smokes and what we what Romero does with the barrels and the and the toasting of the barrels and so mm -hmm. like you said it's it's very specific and so in, in that sense there is there could be some slight uh parallel to you know atmospheric smoke versus the the smokiness yeah. from a barrel uh, obviously in small you know judicious volumes but uh certainly it um can augment in a good way perhaps yeah no and, and like i said how far away you are from the fire makes the biggest difference if you're right next to the fire and it's, it's how old that smoke is. And, you know, young smoke will, will smoke just like if you're standing next to a campfire. I mean, you will smell like a campfire, you know, but if you're far enough away, even though you're still getting, you still getting a little of that smoke, it doesn't like permeate your clothes and everything like, like, a, like being right next to it does. So here's, here's a good question in the same vein, which is, um, 
Uh, is it, can you determine these, some of these factors by tasting the grapes directly or more of the, more of the wine after it's been in the barrel? It's more of the wine. A lot of times in the grapes, when there's sugar, the, the smoke is in a bound form. And so you can't really taste it directly on the grapes. Although if you can, then that means it's really bad. But, uh, but, but for the most part, it's at the end of fermentation that you really start, or even like towards the end of fermentation, that you really start to go like, oh, wow, this is, this is smoked. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and there's not much you can do about it at this point. Although, I don't know, there's some promising research going on right now about uh, helping with smoke taint removal. So that, that's a great recap of the vintage. I, I think overall, I would say that, uh, that what we're tasting in the fermenters and now in the barrels is, is that there's some really sound wines or some delicious wines. Uh, you know, certainly for us, we've been very lucky as we were in 2017 as well with, with small exceptions. And so um, I think looking forward, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of great wines to be made. And like you said, Massimo, it really, uh, you, you can still make uh, poor wines in a great vintage and you can still make great wines in a, in a poor vintage as well. Poor if vintage. you do all the right things, you pay attention. And, and of course, that's what we do here, having uh, you and, and Julian and Ramiro. It's, it's a lot of small details, a lot of choices, a lot of decision, but also the ability to look at that and make those decisions. I think that's really informative to how we get the best wines in the bottle each and every year, regardless of what happens. And like you said, there's challenges, there's challenges, whether it's drought, whether it's rain or whether it's uh, fires you know, or anything. <laughs> yeah. Heat waves and that will continue. There's always been some challenges like this, you know, now, now kind of fires at the forefront and that will continue, but it will also dissipate as well. So, um, so what I'd like to do is open up to, to questions and uh, there's a number of questions that we haven't gotten to in the chat. Um, but also if you guys want to uh, ask questions uh, uh, via the audio, please just go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll kind of field some of those things. So any, any questions going back for Julian or, or questions for Miro? Uh, and of course, questions for Malsimo. Um, but just to start that off, uh, I want to get back to some questions um, for for Ramiro regarding the barrels. Um, and uh, um, Julian, I'm sorry, uh, um, Ramiro, a, a question here about, um, you, and you talked about this a little bit, but um, can you talk about the the toasting and, and how that affects the different flavors, uh, sort of oakier uh, profiles versus less oakier profiles uh, relative to the toasting? Yeah, of course. So um, the, the, the oaky taste uh, is not only the toasting part to it, it depends on the, what type of wood you use. I mean, if you, if you use uh, American oak and any type of wine, you're usually going to be uh, uh, more, much stronger taste of the, of the oak because American oak is, it has a stronger, stronger taste. Uh, I mean, if you put any, any of those wines that you guys drinking today in, in an American oak, uh, you have to put them on for six months the most, otherwise in a barrel. Otherwise the, the, the uh, oak will overpower the fruit, basically. Yeah. The French oak, you know, you can actually toast the barrel a little longer and live wine there for two years and you can still get that softness you know the because french oak allows the wine to breathe a little more you know wine make i mean they, they know more than me about this uh, I, one thing i was thinking about the smoke tent uh, uh i i don't know i, I mean it's just my belief I, i'm not a winemaker here but this year if if, if we be able to toast the, the barrels a little longer you might hide some of that oh you know Smoke tan, you know, with a higher toast, you will taste more of the oak than, than the, the smoke tan. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you're using grapes, again, uh, if, that, uh, that low on tannins, uh, you want to use a, a lower, lower uh, toast levels, like medium, um, maybe medium plus, but, you know, no more than that, uh, because... Uh, uh, you basically, uh, uh, if you cook all the tannins of, of the oak and don't have no tannins on the grapes, then the, the wine will be kind of flat. And that's not what our style is. You know, our style is more of a big bold Cabernet, especially the Brion. So that's why the higher, the higher the tannins on the grapes, the higher you want to toast them. So you'll get only one tannins, not both together. 
for the Pinos, uh, I mean, the, the toast I use, it's, uh, it's basically spicy going into chocolate, then I pull the barrel out. So I don't want it to be chocolate because you still want a lot of those tannins in the, in the Pinot. And I mean, to me, hands down, be wise pinots are the best of the valley for me i mean i mean they're really really good i mean the fruit has a lot to do with it i mean the barrels are, i mean i've been talking about barrels 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 but you know it's, it's a teamwork here you got to have good grapes good winemakers good cellar guys good barrel everyone has to contribute and i, I mean it's not only one thing you know so uh I don't know if that answers your question or what else uh, you want. No, that, that's, that's a great point, Ramiro. And I think you brought up a good point there as well, which is, um, you know, the communication with you directly, with Julian, with Massimo, with Mark and the team is, you know, that's, that's pretty unusual. And having that kind of, that kind of yeah. direct communication and detail is, you know, it's, it's, it's not very common at all. I mean, it's like when you were working for Seguin Moreau, I mean, yeah. I'm sure you were making barrels for hundreds of winemakers, but it wasn't that specific. And, Kind of as it is now. I mean, you're working for yeah, uh, for correct. Caldwell, for for Brian, and you have there's a just you know three or four winemakers, and so you yeah. can really have a, a, a you know face to face conversation, ongoing conversation, and talk about results, and talk about uh, influences, and talk about trying new things, changing things, being more specific by vineyard, and so on. And so uh, uh, that really brings a certain precision, a certain consistency that that's hard to replicate. Yeah, when when you work work for a big cooperage. Uh, the the worst part here is that, that uh, it's not only one person that is chosen the barrels. You know, when it, when you're building 100 and 150 barrels a day, usually between seven to ten people toasting barrels. So each each one of them has his own style to to smell the barrels or to toast them. So you, it, it's pretty hard to get consistency on the barrels. That's why uh, the way we're doing it, I think, is. I believe it's the best way, you know, if you have the same guy building the barrels all the time, it's not going to make the wine better, but it's going to make it consistent. Yeah. Which is a critical thing. And, uh, you know, as Massimo said, it makes the job a little, a little more able to pay attention to other important details. Uh, yeah. so just quickly, you guys, I want to mention, there's been a lot of questions, uh, about whiskey, uh, and, uh, Brian's new whiskey, which is called Constable, is available, and you can find some details at constablewhiskey.com. Um, just, just out, brand new now, so there'll be other whiskeys coming as well, so we have some, some fun things. Actually, we're, Ramiro is sitting right behind Ramiro. You'll see some barrels of whiskey yeah. that will be bottled uh, sometime in the next several months, so there'll be other whiskeys coming. Right now, we have the premier 15-year-old whiskeys, which are uh, definitely some of the best right now. Um, uh, so kind of uh, scrolling down, there's a, a question about sharpening your tools, Ramiro, and can you talk about how you sharpen your tools? Yeah, well, um, just a hand file. Basically, hand file uh, uh, is the best way. Uh, when you use a, one of those grinders, uh, it's hard to get it even. So if you use a hand file, you, you start with the hand file and then you use the stone. You know, with the rough stone at the end, you end up with a really fine stone and the sharp the sharper they are, the, the easier to make your job. You know, that's so, uh, you have to sharpen them at least twice a week. I still remember when I was in school, uh, this is a funny thing that, uh, uh, you know, the, basically our teacher will come in every morning, grab our scraper and try to scrape ahead on the barrel. And if it was dull, he would throw it on the floor and say, you got to sharp that. So I always have that on my mind. Every morning I come in, check my tools, they're all sharp. Okay, we're ready to go. So at home, are your kitchen knives very sharp also? Well, they are. Yeah, it's just a <laughs> habit that I have to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's awesome. So just quickly, guys, another question about, uh, about, the, boat, about the boat cruise in Bordeaux. Uh, so the cruise happening at very, very end of May, early June 2021. And uh, the answer being is we are full steam ahead. And uh, we're, uh, everything we have in place is, is still there. And so we're excited to be able to, to share the Chateau visits and so on. And uh, if anyone needs information about that, we're happy to send the link to the website where you can find out more details. Uh, but as it is now, we're, we're moving forward and um, uh, we're excited to, to, to share the cruise with everyone who's, who's currently participating. And there are a few cabins available. So keep that in mind, uh, share it with your friends and 
uh, think about perhaps joining us. So no, another question here about, uh, about uh, experiments, anything that was different perhaps this year or the last year about wine making experiments or, or different fermentation processes uh, that might be happening uh, as just trying something different. Uh, uh, I'm not sure Julian or Massimo, if you can talk about that for uh, uh, any kind of experiments happening currently. You, you want us to give us all the tricks? All the secrets, yeah. All the secrets. Um, <laughs> That's a sign, an NDA. <laughs> no, but for the people visiting Napa Valley, I think you need to come to see the winery. I mean, many of you have been to the Be Wise winery, but I think the, you need to come to visit the Sleeping Lady. Uh, and it's a beautiful integration of an old barn with uh, pretty modern you know, techniques. Um, I think Massimo, me, Mark were very traditional in the sense that um, we do experimentation in the way we pick, the way we extract, the way the manipulation of the fruit and more than really using machines or using um, very unnatural, I will say, or very mechanical process. And I think um, really everything is done in the vineyards and the the way we handle it, the gentleness. Uh, someone was asking a question, like, how do you know the quality of it? Is it in the fruit when you taste it, or is it when the wine is in the barrel? But it's all along the process. You get two heat waves, and you see sunburn on the berries, and you start thinking, like, should we split that? You know, how do we select? Um, and that ongoing process, because you know the type of aromatics it's going to give you. So that little approach at every step allows us to adjust. And sometimes there are micro adjustments, which is just a temperature of fermentation, a length of a pump over, an extra punch down. It might look at detail or something that can be replaced, but in the end, they, they, they inch everything in a direction that allows you to do something special. So we are, it's very empirical in a way, and we're always, you know, um, I mean, I have a scientific training, but the, uh, I value the empirical part because this is what allows you to push it beyond what's going on. Long story. Uh, I, I would say that we don't normally experiment too much. It's, it's, it's these little, as Julian's saying, micro adjustments, especially when we've got fantastic grapes. Again, it's, it's, it's not a secret on how to make good wine. Just let the wine happen and just do a good job. It, it, yeah, if you adjust the temperature a little bit, maybe an extra pump over, maybe wait a few more days till you press. But but basically, within a simple 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 window, we're not experimenting too much. We've kind of found our our way and our idea of what we want to do. Massimo, relative to once the wines are are in the barrel, uh, what kind of things do you think about during that process? Uh, basically, at that point, where, where I'm just I'm just following the wine because at that point the wine is made. It, it, it's it's done. It is what it is. I'm just following it along. To, at that point, I'm just tasting to make sure nothing's going wrong in the barrel. I, you know, the, the, the you know, our sulfurs are up to to par, and you know, no, nothing funky is growing in there, or nothing nothing's going bad with the wine. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's it's not much to do other than just planning on what, what's going to make the, the A grade and what's going to make the B grade, but it's, that's, that's about it. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so this is a question for Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda Wise is someone's asking what your favorite uh, wine is besides the rosé. <laughs> well, um, currently it does change, but, um, I love our Sonoma Cab Franc, which we don't make every year. And I don't get very often because when we do make it, it goes out to wine club and I don't get to try it very often, but I, it's always been one of my favorites. But recently I got to do a vertical tasting at the barn in Sleeping Lady. And Julian, I loved your wine the best. I thought the Sleeping Lady Brion was just incredible. I mean, I love all of them, of course. And the Oakville has up till now been my favorite, but uh, I thought the Sleeping Lady was just incredible. Thank you. There you go. That's great. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah. Uh, so Massimo, a question for you is, uh, um, what is something that you love most all the years working with us and working with Brian, making wines. It's, it's Brian and Rhonda. Uh, that's, you know, the, in this, this world that I'm, you know, this, this dream job that I have of making wine, I, I only work for people that I like. 
and and, and I love Brian and Rhonda. They're they're it, it's uh, they're family, and uh, it's uh, they've been good to me throughout the years. And and Brian has been able to show us you know, new vineyards and new just access to things that I never would have been able to get on my own. And uh, he's just you know getting the best grapes, getting getting the right equipment, and it's it's just it's it's been wonderful. If you think about that, you know, we started making a couple hundred cases of wine yeah. uh, from Sonoma, Napa, and fast forward 19 years, and now it's, I feel like Brian's just getting started. Yeah, uh, we, we, we've <laughs> new, come a new long way since 200 new cases. Making, new, new everything, yeah. He's a man that, no, that never rests. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, this is Brian. My job is easy, actually. Yeah. My job is to find and try to figure out how we get into the best vineyards and have the best grower hat on it. And of course, John Carlo, um, who's my partner at Sleeping Lady has done a hell of a job finding vineyards um, for me and him to get involved in. And uh, Caldwell and his team does a good job, of course, Enrique at our place farms well. But, you know, it's my job's the easiest part and that's to find the best vineyards. Uh, after that, it really is the, the guys growing the grapes and the winemakers making the wine and, and Colin putting it all together and making sure that it's all comes out right. So uh, I've got the easiest job with the bunch. You're leading a good team. You have to have a great leader. Yeah. But you need a lot of people to do everything. Um, so uh, there's a quick, quick question here about, about, uh, about sleeping lady and about uh, Cabernet Franc. And just so you know, we, we hope to bottle a 2018 Sleeping Lady Cabernet Franc. Uh, has not been bottled yet, but that would be the, the maiden voyage of that particular wine. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We, we do have the B-Wise uh, Sonoma side Cab Franc. Uh, just actually just sold out for the, the vintage just now, but we'll have another one coming next year. Uh, but there's a question here for the winemakers about, uh, about Bordeaux style wines and blending the five Bordeaux varietals. So if you guys want to talk a little bit about blending, uh, maybe Massimo can start with that. We have, because uh, typically we've grown all the Bordeaux varietals and we, we were growing even Malbec back in the day. And then we stopped fighting that because the crop was not, it would had a lot of problems holding crop. Um, and so we've been slowly kind of uh, pairing it, uh, homing in on the better grapes, which for us are Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, and a little bit of Petit Verdot. But uh, maybe Massimo, you can talk a little bit about blending and the, and the Bordeaux varietals. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it starts off, it, it's, it's a very uh, drawn out process. It's, it's not one tasting that, that we make the blend on. It's, it's uh, actually, it's about, a, you know, it's about a year of tasting and then another, like a month of intes in, intensive tasting where, you know, it's just we come back to the same wine every other day and, okay, this is going in, this is, you know, we need a little bit of this, we need a little, you know, a, a little Cap Franc here, we go, go, go great, and a little, a little uh, Petit Syrah, you know, just, just, a, just a little smidge of Petit Syrah makes this fantastic. You know? It's just little things like that that, that, uh, that make the blend, but really, I mean, we're a Cabernet house, it's mostly Cabernet, and then it's just, Basically, it's, it becomes back down to terroir. Uh, there's certain sites on our vineyards that are just a little bit better, and those those make the the A grade, and and uh, that's that's how it's just go through and taste the best ones, and and uh, you know then just trial and error and see see blend blend a little bit of this in there, a little of that in there, and, and see what happens. But you really don't know for sure until you actually make the blend and taste it. Hey, let me add a little something, and I'd like to get Julian to come in on this, but. Traditionally in Bordeaux, you know, they put they put all these different grapes in and, and especially Merlot. And in California, with the clones, and this is my opinion, but with the clonal work that we have in Cabernet Sauvignon today, we can take Cabernet, there's Cabernet that's very aromatic, like Cab Franc, or we can take Cabernet that has more structure. And with the Cabernet Sauvignon grape alone, we can come out with a fabulous wine. In Bordeaux, I think they had to have these other grapes to add the elements that we find that we can do with clones. Is, uh, so let me ask Julian to speak to that. Yeah, I think um, you're right into the, the variation of clones. I mean, the, the quick story for clones is they will be all blended in the vineyards in Bordeaux. 
and uh, Davis did a work of uh, separation and we started to plant them in different plots. Now we start to pull from it and bring them back. So we're doing the whole circle. Um, the Cabernet Franc, the Petit Verde de Marbec were also, and it used to be Syrah actually a long time ago in Bordeaux, uh, used to be like bon bonfire. Uh, you know, you add those to blend and depending on the year, depending on the ripeness, you use one or the other to compensate for the vintage or what gave you. I think uh, many times in, in Napa, we don't need that. We can just have an optimal ripeness on its own. And I think in the research we're doing right now in developing those vineyards and those bottling, having a single varietal and being very pure in, in each bottling allows you to really have a consistent taste from year to year uh, because it's exactly the same vines and the, the blend is not changing a lot. So that's really the, the direction. I think as soon as we start blending uh, other varietals, we more have a stylistic research rather than a single vineyard approach. Uh, and then you have a bigger leverage as a winemaker to blend and to determine a style. And if we research a house style, I think the, the code the blending or the use of the different varietal allows you to manipulate, I have the kids in the right. Um, allows you to manipulate the blends a little more and, and create, so you have less variation uh, but you, and you have less vintage change, but you have less uh, single vineyard expression and uh, you have a little more of a holistic approach. So I think things will change also as things evolve, but like Sleeping Lily Cabernet Franc, we've been really working on it. Sadly, in 20, uh, Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot have been soaking up smoke more. I mean, they're French varietal. They, they like smoke a little more than the others. Uh, but um, so we're not going to have it in 20. But the, the, the idea of bringing those as single varietal bottling as well is very interesting because it allows you to have a, a, a char different character, very pure from the side. Great, Julian. Thank you. Uh, so another question here uh, about Tanat and the future of Tanat. Ryan, you want to talk about Tanat? Uh, sure. Uh, John Caldwell and I went over to over to the Pyrenees in France to discover the best Tanat made on the planet. And what we dis discovered was Tanat that went well with a two-year-old sheep, but something that most people in the U.S. wouldn't drink. They're very, very tannic. But we decided to go ahead and bring it back and raise it. And what we found in California, because we can get ripe versus in the Pyrenees, where it's cold and turns to winter early, that we could produce a wine. And with, with uh, Massimo's help, we're able to get it ripe enough to really get the tannin structure down and to let the flavor profile come through. We don't do a lot of it, but it's a fun grape and it's uh, it's kind of fun like Zinfandel. It's it, you know, it's got it's got great flavors um, and with its softer and tannins. And Moss, let me let you take over. You're the guy that Yeah, it's, that, it's, it's, it's the last grape we pick on the on, on the property. It's uh because the tannin is insane, the acid is insane. It just, it, it, we have to let that age out and it, it finally calms down uh, probably about a week after we've picked everything else. And then, uh, and then we make that wine and it makes a really interesting wine. I mean, it's, it's fun because it's not a normal variety that you get to have all the time. So it's just nice to have something different. You know, I hate to say this, but you know, just not Cabernet again. You know, it's something a little, uh, a little, uh, a little fun that we can, you know, but, it's got full flavor and full a full mouth feel and it's it's uh, it, it, it's uh it's really interesting it's 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 a it's a very fun interesting wine i think interestingly it seems to me that the tanat is actually oftentimes the first to flower and then yeah. last to pick so it's it's the earliest start and and latest finish so it's sort of interesting there um but if you haven't had the tanat it's uh it's a monster it's a it's a great wine it's uh if you like Cabernet, you'll love to not too. It's, it's different expression, but uh, has a lot of depth, a lot of structure, uh, a lot of impact for sure. Um, so let's see, there's a question about this, about uh, uh, years of people working with Brian. And so uh, I guess I can just briefly talk about that. So Massimo with his brother in the first couple of years, his brother Mario uh, made our first wines over in Napa Valley. So 2002, 
they started together making the wines. Um, so that would be, uh, what's that Moss? 18 years, 18 right? years, 18. 19 years. Um, I, ha I was actually there the day that they crushed the first Napa grapes from uh, the Bennett Vineyard that day, in, uh, October 2020, or October 2002. I remember distinctly uh, Mario on the forklift and almost dumped the bin off the side because I was talking to him, asking too many questions probably. <laughs> but um, in any case, so but I ha I've been working since that time. And, and in fact, 2004, started working with the wine. So that's about 16 years. But I had worked for Brian prior at the wine bars out in Colorado. So, uh, in Colin, fact, Colin started when he was uh, four years old because he's, <laughs> he's, he's been at it 25 years now. So, so yeah, so uh, April this year was my 25th year. So, kind of a, a milestone. Uh, Elizabeth, Good who's. Go uh, without you, Colin. I'm sorry? And we couldn't do it without you. Oh, uh, well, thanks. Uh, Julian has been now five years, which seems like just yesterday, but, uh, we're really excited about what he's bringing to the mix. And of course, Ramiro, uh, making barrels, it's been seven years making barrels. Yeah. So, and then Elizabeth, who's the youngest on the team here, uh, three years working with us now, three, four years. So, uh, time flies, you know, so, uh, uh, always, always important to drink good wine because you never know what's going to happen. And time goes by and all of a sudden, like I said earlier, it's like, uh, Better too soon than too late to drink your bottle. Plus, there's that COVID test. If you can smell it and you can taste it, yeah. you're okay. Well, that's right. So we, we, we recommend testing often and frequently. I do it every day. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Last few questions coming in, you guys. Um, someone's asking about Syrah. Uh, Syrah... Um, we, we, you know, we've sort of been cutting back on the Syrah at the home vineyard there on the Sonoma side, but uh, we love Syrah and it's a wonderful varietal. And in fact, uh, Brian has some plans to, to really focus on the, some Syrahs and some actually Rhone varietals in general. So Grenache as well uh, down at the Amapola yep. Creek Winery, which is the newest acquisition. So for those who are not familiar, we're, we're now operating three wineries, uh, the, the, uh, the home estate, the BYS Vineyards. Uh, cave and winery. And then we also have the Amapola Creek, which is uh, Richard Arrowwood's former winery, just the neighboring winery down the street there. Uh, Brian acquired that in January this year. And then, uh, of course, opening our new facility in Napa Valley, uh, the Brion Barn Winery uh, near Yountville. So uh, there's, it's been a big year for us. Uh, on top of that, we've had COVID. So lots of craziness has happened. Um, but uh, look forward to sharing more with all those properties with you guys down the road. Uh, and of course, great wines as always.